Hi, I'm Femi OK. And I'm Malika Bilal, and you're in the stream. Today, Yar Jassi joins us to talk about her debut novel, Homegoing, and what it means to her to be black in America. Everyone was responsible. We all were. We all are, writes author Yar Jassi in her debut novel, Homegoing, about African complicity in the slave trade. The book follows the family tree of two half-sisters born in 18th century Ghana. One sold into slavery and the other married off to a British soldier at the Cape Coast Castle. Through their voices and their descendants, the novel tells the story of what it means to be black in the U.S. I'm pleased to say that Yar Jassi is with us in the Stream Book Club. Welcome, Yar. Hi, thank you for having me. Thanks for being here. Also joining this conversation are members of our community. In Accra, Ghana, Akosia Hansen. She's a writer and actress. In Massachusetts, journalist Erica Ayisi. And in York, Pennsylvania, Travis Karofsky. He's a writing professor at York College. Welcome, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. So, yeah, when people say to you, you're African-American, what does your face do? And then what do, you, what do you say in response to that when they describe you? What does my face do? Yeah. I, I guess my face just reacts normally. I think that's, um, you know, that's kind of a common thing that people say. Yeah. Um, like, as, you know, as a, as a placeholder, I guess, for black. Yeah. Um, if I want to explain further, I, I usually tell them that I was born in Ghana. Um, and grew up in America. And so um, typically, I suppose, if, if asked to identify myself, I would say Ghanaian American. Do you feel more one than the other? Where's your connection? Where's your poor? You know, I don't feel more one than the other. I was born in Ghana, but I only lived there until age two. And then we moved to Ohio, Illinois, Tennessee, Alabama. Um, but I spent most of my most of my life here, um, though I think my parents really tried as hard as they could to kind of um, instill in us, I guess, a sense of, of Ghanaian heritage and, you know, to keep that culture alive. So um, so I still feel Ghanaian and I, I certainly feel American. It's interesting hearing you describe how you see yourself. And I wonder if that differs with how people see you. This is a video comment we got from someone. And I'm interested to hear what you think of Lewis. As an African, and in my opinion, you are also an African American. Um, how do you incorporate the idea that white dominant culture in North America won't willingly extend the concept of freedoms to non whites? Do you feel that as a continental African, this gives you a different approach to that sort of American liberty? Or do you feel that one foot? is also within the destiny of the African-American experience. So yeah, lots of questions there. But at the top, he says he considers you African-American. What do you say to that? Yeah, I mean, I, I definitely identify as African-American as well as African. Um, again, I grew up here mostly. Um, I have no real memories from uh, my time in Ghana. Um, and so I think, you know, in terms of, in terms of um, my experience uh, in America, it's certainly been a very black one. Um, af but in terms of historically, I don't have the kind of African American heritage, the, the history, the, um, you know, my ancestors did not, did not come here through the slave trade. Um, and so, and so that, that kind of differentiates me, I think um, there's, uh, yeah. Erica, there's definitely this tension that happens in the US where if you're black and you have a different heritage that doesn't come from being an African American, there's a tension between being maybe from the African continent and then maybe from North America. Do you understand what Yar's talking about? Do you get questioned in that same way? I do understand what she's talking about and I think the bigger picture is that there's a, a group of people that know their direct descendants and know their history. And then there's another group of people with the same skin color that just that don't know their history. And I think that's the core of that conversation is maybe, you know, people may feel like they know their history. They have that advantage. They know their aunties. They know what village they come from. They know their traditional food versus another group of black people don't. And it's it. And they and there's this seems to be the, this divide over you know your history and I don't and there's always that constant clash so I definitely understand that perspective. What resonates for you out of what Erica and y'all have been talking about? 
uh, Travis. Travis, oh, you, sorry. yeah, sorry, <laughs> Travis, yeah. 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 yeah you're, you're nodding. No, what, I mean, what's it, resonating? Um, it, actually, I was thinking about Lorraine Hansberry's *Raised in the Sun*. Um, a, oh. a lot of um, when they were talking about this, but this this idea about having having the knowledge or not, I think, really separates um, separates people. But no, it's just nodding in agreement. Sure. <laughs> Uh, part yeah. of the, there's a, there's a section in the book, Yar, where it's coming up to more contemporary times, and um, one of the young characters in the book is actually asked to talk about her background, her heritage, and her teacher just says, well, you, you're not Ghanaian, you, you're actually black here in America, you're just black. Uh, what were you trying to unpack there with that idea? Yeah, I think with, with that idea, I was kind of focusing on um, this tendency that sometimes African immigrants in America have to kind of, you know, retain their, um, retain their home identity in a way that kind of excludes uh, black identity. Um, and, and for me personally, again, having grown up mostly in America, I had this wonderful teacher who, um, who kind of laid it out for me saying, you know, when you're here, you're black and it's worth your while to learn the experiences of African Americans, um, to learn that history and, and to start thinking about how you might be involved with that history. Um, and so, and so I think in that moment I was trying to kind of call up the idea of diaspora, you know, black is connected. Do you remember when you had that conversation, was, was that a, a, a milestone for you as, as a young person growing up, where that conversation was like, ah, this is who I am, this is important? I think it certainly was eye-opening, you know, I think it was um, kind of one of the first people who in my life um, reached out to me and, and, and talked to me about um, African American identity. Um, I think, you know, when you kind of grow up with um, with parents who, who didn't grow up in the same way as you, um, regardless of, of how that came about. Um, you kind of learn how to, how to make your own way, um, and, and there are people in your life who can, who can help you figure that out. So one of the things Yaa mentioned, Akosia, was that process of learning history. So I just want to delve right into this because we got a lot of questions about this. This is a comment we got from someone named Mago Godi who says, one of the book's biggest gifts is dispelling some of the myths that we still hold true, that Africans did not profit from slavery. I'm curious what kinds of complicated conversations Yaa sees opening up both in the U.S. and in Ghana as people read her work. And so, of course, Yaa yeah, can comment on that, but Akosia, I'm giving that to you because you're in Ghana. One of the things uh, that really resonated with me when I read the book was this memory that was a little bit deep and kind of latent because I remember reading Africans were implicit in the slave, slave trade, but it's not one of the things that was kind of pounded into our heads in our history books growing up here in the States. Um, so I wonder yeah. how that was for you and what conversations are you having with friends? Okay, so um, Ghanaians generally on the continent have not really engaged with our history of slavery. Um, even though the testament of the castles, the slave castles are the Cape Coast Castle, Elmina Castle, I would say it's more like a, a tourist place to send tourists. But Ghanaians engaging with the fact that we were complicit in, in slavery um, is something we, we have not um, talked about or probably gone through a process of healing. Um, I, I must say at the time when all of this was happening, Ghana was not Ghana. Um, Ghana is, uh, is a Western border that was created. We, more, we were more like uh, ethnic groups. Um, as Yah shows in her book, the different ethnic groups and the rivalries and who sells who um, to slavery. So we still, the ethnic groups were nations in a sense, nation versus nation, uh, before the border of, of Ghanaians had been created. And I think uh, Yah JC's book is, 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 is a question I actually wanted to ask. I feel this is going to be one big first process for Ghanaians to actually try to engage with that history. A lot of the time we make it seem as though it's, is an African American thing, um, but we it started from us, you know. So I it's something I like to preach a lot, at least on radio and TV here, that when you hear about the police brutality in the States, it all it all just links to us, you know, because some of the people there were from Ghana and from Ashanti, from Fanti, from Ewe, from Nigeria, you know. Um, so I feel this book is gonna be um, an eye opener. I hope we would actually start to engage with that part of our history with this book. Yeah, what are the comments have you got from Ghanaians who are reading your book and thinking, oh, I didn't see myself yeah. in that way or my, right. my ancestors in that way? 
Right. I mean, I, I think this is, as Akosia was saying, this is a part of Ghanaian history that is not often spoken about even among Ghanaians. You know, um, I've, I had asked my parents if they'd learned this kind of thing in school, and they said no. Um, when I went to the castle myself in 2009, I went because I was with a friend um, and needed touristy type things to do. And so exactly. I, I totally understand what Akosia is saying, that this castle, even though it stands, you know, only 52 miles away from mm -hmm. my mother's home, hometown um, is not really kind of a part of, of Ghanaian identity, Ghanaian experience. Tell us about this castle. If, if you know anything about Ghana, you will know about the castle on the Gold Coast. But mm -hmm. for people who haven't or who might go, tell us about the castle. Sure. So the Cape Coast Castle, the one that I write about in the book, though there are several others, um, was kind of the seat of British power during colonialism. Um, it was established um, kind of as a trading center generally, but um, the main trade, uh, the trade that we that we kind of think of today was the slave trade. Um, on the upper levels, they had uh, rooms for the soldiers and um, a hospital and a kitchen, and it was this very expansive thing. Um, but then underneath, there were the dungeons that they kept slaves in before sending them out through um, through the Middle Passage. Um, and so this, this castle um, still stands in Cape Coast, Ghana. You can still go visit it and and kind of learn the history take the tours um, but it, it was a it was a very kind of important um, center both of colonialism and of this of the slave trade and yeah and just reading about it in your book made me uncomfortable I know that's the same is true for other people I, I want to share a comment we got from someone uh, William St. Clair he's a historian and actually it's been reported that you read his book The Door of No Return to do the research for your own book take a look at my laptop here he sent us to this comment he says I've received letters from people asking if I could help trace their ancestors and many turn out to be the descendants of the slavers and not the slaves so he wants to know are they right to feel disappointed and is it helpful to think in terms of guilt or in terms of heredity Hereditary guilt? Do you think in those hmm. terms? That's an, that's a great question. I don't know. Oh, wow. um, I don't know if, if if it is helpful to think in terms of hereditary guilt, or if you know feeling guilty right now is is the kind of like um, I don't know the kind of useful turn that 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 you need to think of. But um, but it is important, I think, to recognize that that this this trade had two sides not just the slave uh not just the slaves underneath but the slave traders um and so finding out that you were a part of the wrong side per se could totally be a devastating discovery and yet i don't think that that's something that should limit you i think you should still kind of seek out ways to learn about the history um to engage with the history and think about ways to you know kind of contribute um to society in ways that make it better you know Travis, what did you want to add? Yeah. I have a question that um, I'd like to pose to Yah in, in talking about the African di diaspora and kind of dissecting it when we were talking about the Black American experience versus the, the African and the first generation experience. Do you think that there's a sense of classism between the two where it's one issue of, okay, this one group knows their direct history and their ancestors and another group doesn't, but also when they come here, it's, it's, a, it's a class issue. And we've seen reports, you know, over the years that, you know, certain Nigerian students are the top of their class and black Americans feel like, you know, we may not be getting that, that same amount of shine as the, the, those Africans that just came or the, or the first generation. So is it also maybe a, a, a sub issue of uh, classism between uh, Native Africans, first generation Africans versus black Americans. Yeah, I mean, I would say that I think the, you know, the American dream, the thing that we call the American dream is still very much, um, is very much denied African Americans. Um, you still kind of have access to whole worlds um, as, as a black immigrant that you don't get as African Americans. Um, and so I, I've certainly heard people talk about how when percentages are given about how many black students are in a college, for example, um, typically those spaces are kind of taken up mostly by, um, not mostly, but there are large percentages of Ghanaians or Nigerians or Haitians or Jamaicans or whatever that also kind of make up that, that group. Um, and does that mean that it's denying African Americans access to those same spaces? Um, and so I think that is kind of a larger part of this conversation. What do, what do um, we have access to and what don't we have access to? And what privileges are afforded African immigrants that aren't afforded um, black people? Travis, go ahead. Mm -hmm. 
<laughs> actually, I was fascinated actually by by all that too. But I was wondering a little bit going back to the history um, from the Cape Coast Castle. Um, so I grew up in Oregon, um, and my history um, classes in high school and in college told me nothing. And if it was mentioned, I I, I could have been absent that day about um, the Ghanaian um, and the African um, African zone sort of um, part in the, the slave trade. I mean, so reading your book, I think one of the big things, uh, besides as, um, as Femi already noted, um, it's a really complex book and there's a lot to get through. One of the big things for me as I struggle through it is just to know how much, I mean, how much is history and how much, how much is stuff that, that you as a storyteller are, are kind of, kind of adding on to it. I think there's always this, this wanting to learn from historical films and historical books. And I really want to learn from say homegoing. And I actually was, so I was, I was um, interested in as a writer and then also at, at, for your book, but as a writer, how much you feel like you need to stay accurate to history. I saw there was a lot of research in the back of the book that you feel you've gone back to a lot and you are asked this question in just about every interview, but how much do you feel like you need to be accurate to that, to that, um, the Ghanaian history, as well as uh, the history in Baltimore and Pratt City and, and other places. All right, yeah. Which States. bits did you made up? Fess up. Which bits did you yeah, make sort up? Of. <laughs> so that Travis knows <laughs> not to believe those chapters. That's what he wants yeah. to know. What's the made up bit? <laughs> I mean, you know, it is, it is at the end of the day, it's a novel. It's a work of fiction. The whole thing is like, you know, just propped up by my imagination. Uh -huh. um, but at the same time, um, when you are writing historical fiction, particularly historical fiction that kind of um, has a political bent to it, I think you do have a certain responsibility to bolster that with the truth, you know. And so it was important to me to include those sources in the back of the book so that if readers, um, you know, got something out of the book and wanted to learn more, more, they could go back and kind of research the history of Pratt City or research the Cape Coast Castle through William St. Clair's book um, or look at the Fanti and the Transatlantic Slave Trade by Rebecca Shumway. Like it was important to me to include kind of non-fiction so, yeah, you know uh, people are gonna be You know book. people are going to be reading Homegoing and thinking that every single thing in that book is historically accurate. What right. do you say to people who do that? And you're like, I know about, I know about the transatlantic <laughs> slave trade now because I read Yar's book and now I right. know. And it's very convincing, but it's fiction. What, it's what, fiction, what, exactly. warning, what warning do you want to give people? I mean, I always would warn anyone who is reading kind of historical fiction as a, um, you know, in place of nonfiction or, uh, yeah. or research, um, that that's, you know, that practice is, is, is flawed. You know, you have to kind of go Ooh. back to the original sources if you want to yeah, get a sense Yeah, I just called you out. For, um, <laughs> if you want to get a sense Read for, a proper for the history book. Yeah. Um, yeah. All right. A lot of the things yeah, in this I, book are true, but then a lot, you know, a lot are, are bolstered by my imagination. Amazing. Okay, so yeah, so someone online yeah. wants to know how much it was bolstered. This is Mrs. M. She says, oh my gosh, I would love to know how much is autobiographical. I pictured her <laughs> when I read about Marjorie, of course, who's one of the characters that comes on, yeah. comes in a little bit later in the book. Yeah, I mean, it's, I, I tried at my hardest to not do any kind of gene, uh, genealogical research about my own family uh, before writing this book because I didn't want to feel kind of beholden to that truth in any way. Um, I have gotten a lot of people asking if I am Marjorie, and the answer right. is no, though she does, she does so, yeah, kind does, of Do you share think Marjorie looks a bit like this? Have a look at my laptop here. <laughs> Do you think Marjorie looks like that? <laughs> I think she might just look a little bit like that. She was a voracious reader. I don't know. Lucky guess. Um, <laughs> she does share the yeah. characteristics with me, I think, of, any, of anyone in the book. Marjorie and Margaret mm -hmm. yeah, both are kind of the, the two characters that, that kind of embody a lot of my, um, not just my kind of um, upbringing, but also yeah. kind of my, my thoughts around what this project could be, should be. Sure. How, um, old, how old are you in this, in this picture? How old are you here? Um, that picture, I think, is from the third grade. Yeah. Uh, so, like, eight, maybe? Seven or eight? Were you a good writer at that stage? Did you, you wrote lots of essays and what I did in my summer vacation. Were, were you good at that stage? Could you tell? Oh, I loved it. Yeah, I mean, I loved reading so much, and I think very early on for me, I kind of wanted to know if I could do the things that I was seeing done in literature, and so I started writing um, at a very, very young age. Yeah. Um, the also, first a bit of a fashionista. <laughs> 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 this video 
is called How to Embarrass <laughs> Yaw in Five Minutes. <laughs> <laughs> well, for me, this should make up for it. All no right. embarrassment here. This is a tweet we got from I, Marwa. I, uh, let me just share this and then you can jump in because a few people are thinking what Marwa's thinking, especially if you've read uh -huh. the news about Yaw. So Marwa says, I want to know how Miss Jessie felt when her debut novel sold for a million dollars. Of course, we don't have the exact reported amount, but seven figures has been reported in some places. Uh, yeah, was this shocking? Was this, could you have seen that coming? And how much exactly? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if anyone could ever see something like that coming. This, this business is so... Um, you know, it's kind of so uncertain. You know, I think a lot of writers, a lot of artists would agree that when they decide they want to do this for a living, they kind of sign away the idea of making any money. And so, um, so it, it really did shock me and, and really blow me away. Um, but on the other hand, it's, you know, I've, I've wanted to do this my whole life. I've wanted to be a writer my whole life. And so um, it's, been, it's been just kind of magical and, and beautiful that I not only have been able to do it, but that I've kind of been able to do it in such a way that allows me to reach so many people. Who did you write the book for? I mean, we've, yeah. we've, got, a, we've got a cozy here, Erica, Travis, they've all they've either read the book, reading it, enjoying it. Did you, do you have somebody in mind for who would really enjoy this book? You know, I try my best not to write with an audience in mind. Mm -hmm. um, uh, it's easier, I think, before you sell your first book because you, you can just imagine that no one's ever going to read it. Um, but for me, this book was, was very much a, a personal project. You know, I think mm -hmm. I, I wrote it because I was having so many questions about identity, um, ethnic identity, racial identity, you know, kind of what it means to, to be yeah. black in America. Um, and, and so I think if I were to give this book an audience, it, it would have been me in middle school when I had all of these kinds of questions and, and anyone else who, who does right. have those kinds of questions. Akosia, what question do you have? Um, that was a great answer, by the way. Yeah. Um, I, I wanted to ask about um, religion and how you approach it in the book. Um, your approach, you touch on the, the demonization of Akosia, African make it a religion. short question. We're right at the end of the show. So your question is... All right. What? Okay, so the question is, um, basically, uh, you, you spoke about how good and bad these banneries are the way Western Christian religion looks at life. Um, so uh, black magic became black, it became bad, and then Christianity became good. And it's a problem right. Ghanaians are still uh, struggling through today. Traditional religion is yeah, seen as respond. We have and less than I'll two minutes to go. I'll come yeah. I, Sorry, I think how, you, how it. you, I mean, approach this? Um, and, Stop and talking, Akosia. Yeah, start talking. <laughs> Otherwise, we're going to be reading the news um, together. Sure. I mean, I grew up Pentecostal. I was raised Pentecostal in a church in Alabama, and yet I had a father who was always kind of whispering after the pastor spoke. He'd be like, well, you know, if the if the white people had not come to Ghana, X, Y, Z. Um, and so it was always really tempered. Like my ideas of religion were also re always really tempered by ideas that, um, that, that this religion had kind of replaced traditional, um, traditional religions. And so I wanted this book to kind of expand the idea of what religion could do, what spirituality could mean, and for all of those ideas to be valid, you know. Um, in in um, Aquia's chapter, there is the fetish man and there is the missionary, and neither one of those people gets, you know, more weight than the other. You know, Aquia has to, has to kind of reckon with both sides of those stories, um, and that was important to me, to represent kind of traditional ideas about religion and, and more Western and ideas about And if you're trying to work out who Yas has been talking about, her book is called Home Going. It is a available right now on Amazon and she is Yard Yassi. We are taking all of our guests to our online post show. The Stream Book Club will continue there but before that, Malika. Tara uh, tweets in, she tells a friend to join us on the stream to watch you, Ya. She says, growing fan base here in Fiji, tuned in, wow. young women write, young women lead. All right, and one more picture to go out on here on my laptop. <laughs> Yard Yassi, you see so much promise and now look at her. A very rich first-time novelist. Thank you, everybody, for being part of this conversation. I'm your BFF, what, yeah, by the way. Uh, <laughs> we're going online, stream.adzero.com. See you there. Stream Book Club continues in 30 seconds' time.
Hello again, welcome to the post show, stream.adazir.com. But if you're here, you already know that. We're talking about Yar Jassy's debut novel, Home Going. Yar, how many copies of your book do you have around at any one time? <laughs> She's like, I have I'm a novelist, <laughs> have a copy of my book. <laughs> I think I, I've given most of them away, but All I right. think I still have like five or six. All right, pick up one of them. Give us a reading. Okay, sure. What are you gonna read? I'm just gonna read from the opening. All right, um, that's easy. Go ahead. The night Athea Otre was born into the musky heat of Fanti land, a fire raged through the woods just outside her father's compound. It moved quickly, tearing a path for days. It lived off the air. It slept in caves and hidden trees. It burned up and through, unconcerned with what wreckage it left behind until it reached an Ashanti village. There it disappeared, becoming one with the night. Can you remember when you wrote that sentence? How long ago was that? Was that a, oh. <laughs> how many years ago uh, was that? That I probably wrote that part in 2012. So okay. four, year, four years. Ooh, Millie. Oh. <laughs> I have a question. Um, Can I ask a question, please? <laughs> yeah, I have a question. <laughs> Who is? Hold, 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 hold those questions. <laughs> hold those thoughts. Right. Hold on one second. Just a second. Sure. Because Malika has a question. <laughs> I have one from uh, someone on Twitter. This is Nicole. Um, and so I'm giving her preference just because she thanked us for letting her ask a question. So here's Nicole's question. Yeah, she said, did you find switching from a previous point of view to a new one difficult? And for those who haven't written the book, almost each chapter is written from the perspective of someone different. They're all related in, in, in uh, different ways. But how difficult was that? No, I didn't have trouble. I I had um, I made a family tree that I put up above the wall, um, and my family tree looked a lot like the one that's at the front of the novel now, except it also included um, the dates that the that the chapter would take place in, and then one thing that was happening um, kind of politically or historically in the background during that time period. Um, but I used that family tree as a guide, and I knew that I wanted each person's voice to be heard, and I kind of gave myself a twenty to thirty page limit per person. And and um, I think because the long timeline of this book was so important to me, I knew um, pretty early on that I wanted it to cover uh, a very extensive period of time. Um, I, I really privileged that timeline and, and knew that I had to kind of move on every, every um, 30 or so pages. Erica, go ahead. Right, I have um, a question. Eric, Erica, Erica, hold tight. Uh, uh, hold tight. Erica, go, go first. Okay, bringing it back to uh, the Slave Castle, both Cape Coast and Elmina, and I visited both as a tourist and again as a journalist. Visiting Elmina, sure. I asked I asked the tour guide, you know, that dialogue that's uncomfortable to talk about for Africans, especially Ghanaians, about their their responsibility and their role in the slave trade. And I asked him what was their role about it and how does he feel about it. He said that Africans, well. Ghanaians, that they, they didn't know, they, yes, they sold each other into slavery, but they were not aware of the atrocities that the white man was going to do uh, to, to their fellow Africans. And that was his response for that question. How do you feel about that? That, okay, if, if they had known, you know, they were going to chain them and beat them and have them defecate in, in, in a closet sized room, then, oh, yeah, they wouldn't have done it. How do you feel about that response? I don't know. That that response kind of kind of worries me because I feel like it's it's uh, one of those pass the buck kind of moments. Um, on the one hand, I understand what he's saying. It's true that um, you know that people didn't really you didn't really see the outcome. You know, you sold the slaves and then they left. Um, they left your they left your village. They left the castle and they went on to other places. And so you'd never really got to see kind of the results of this trade. And yet at the same time, I think. Um, I think that kind of belies the moral complicity that that was there. You know, um, if you if you sold another person, you were responsible for that. Um, and I don't think you should you should kind of get to to not feel the weight of that. Erica, I'm glad you brought up that question. I have a video comment here from someone we heard a little earlier in the show. And Akosia, I'll direct it to you. Um, this is Louise again, and here's what he talked about on a visit to Ghana and how he felt about that. Have a look. Hello, this is Luis Cluvel calling from the Library of Congress. I'm the founder of the Organization of Indigenous Science Centers. How does the experience of the Case Coast Dungeon miss the translation in present-day Ghana? To be clear, when we return to Ghana, we're called Obruni. 
why would we be identified as the oppressor and colonialist if we are indeed thought of as returning brothers and sisters? Thank you. So you're nodding your head, Ecosia. For those who aren't from Ghana, yeah. he uses a term that really means someone from outside of, of Ghana, of Africa, right. but often usually describing someone right. from Europe. Yeah, so Obroni actually means a white person. Um, mm -hmm. And Obroni has been extended to mean all foreigners. And that just shows you that um, word and it being used on African Americans. I get that from a lot of my African American friends, even sometimes me, uh, because mm -hmm. I, I, of the way I speak my English or something like that. It's, it's usually, it shows how Ghanaians are removed from our history. In a sense, we see this whole slavery thing, uh, slavery as an African-American thing, but not a Ghanaian thing. So when they do come back, we don't see them as part of us, which is why they call them foreigners, in a sense. Um, and, and that's one big problem we have to work with, and that I hope that uh, Yaa's book would actually change. It's something we try to do at the University of Ghana to teach young students coming up that, um, I mean, African-American history, European Africans, um, Africans from Brazil, they're all part of the continent. They're us. And um, I mean, to add on to what Yaa said in response to Erica's question, um, I think um, slavery as was perceived amongst the ethnic groups and how it was practiced was very, very different from how uh, Europeans practice slavery um, in yes. Ghana and, and across Africa. Um, for instance, there was slavery amongst ethnic tribes. You find the Ashantis mm -hmm. would capture people mm -hmm. from different parts. But the, mm -hmm. for instance, with the Ashanti hierarchy, what can happen is a slave can rise, rise through the ranks uh, and come out of slavery and actually even probably be uh, have an official role you know, um, in, in war, in office, in... So it, 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 def it definitely varied from slavery, European slavery. So um, you, get, you get that uh, difference, you get that um, um, misunderstanding from that, you know. And uh, this is just a quick question to you. Uh, when your book came out, there was a whole lot of controversy, I don't know if you heard about this, about your use of the term health caste. Now, uh, caste mm -hmm. um, is signifying a social status, a particular pure status. Half caste, kind of, not kind of, it does uh, imply... Cozier, ask shorter questions. My question is oh. what? Your question is what? All right, so the question is... <laughs> it's a sentence. the term half caste is <laughs> mixed race. Yes. So the, the term half caste appears in the book in one chapter only, and that chapter is Quay's chapter. Quay is the son of the British governor of the Cape Coast Castle and his Fanti wife. Um, and I used that term rather than saying mixed race because I felt like it would be the most historically accurate term to use. Um, I thought if I used the word mixed race, it would be anachronistic for that time period. Um, but I do understand um, how how, you know, that word kind of brings up a lot of a lot of historical baggage, and and it's a word that I know a lot of Ghanaians um, in my mm -hmm. own family who still use yes. that word, um, mm -hmm. and it hasn't been challenged as often as it should. Um, but it is a term that that really carries this this whole weight of colonialism um, with it, and I think it's one that should be examined. Let me just bring in Travis, because yeah. Travis, ladies, hold tight for a hold second. For Let a me second. just bring in Let Travis. Let me just bring in Travis, because he's very patient. Because he's very patient. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, Travis, my, my Travis, big question you, actually was... Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Oh, it, it was actually a, a, a lot about the... Yeah. I mean, this was fascinating to me just to learn some, um, some of the historical accuracies you chose for language to try to stay, well, stay accurate for the, for the time period as opposed to modifying it for contemporary readers. Um, I think it's really helpful to know about how the novel is put together. But I, I was really fascinated by thinking about it, the creative process and how you put together, but there's a really, really complex book of um, both historical research and characters moving through space. And I thought it was a fascinating answer you had for, um, I think, Linda um, on Twitter. But you had a map, you said, right? Then above, you had that above your, your laptop? Yeah. Wow, that's, that's fascinating. Then, how did, then did you add the research through, or did you kind of write the whole thing and so, then go back? So, Travis, and, and explain to people who, are, who haven't read the book yet, explain the structure of the book simply. Oh, it's um, it's it, it's sort of like a, a collection of linked short stories almost. Um, you follow um, the descendants of of two um, half sisters um, from um, different parts of parts of Ghana with the same mother as um, their um, descendants. I think um, eight uh, on each side or something um, kind of move um, either through Ghana or across into the United States and and the Pratt City and other people. And then those two 
finally two descendants come back. And well, 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 not listening, not listening, not listening. You just blew the <laughs> Sorry. book. Thank you uh, so much. Spoiler right. alert. Spoiler okay. alert. All right. <laughs> yeah, so how did you do that? How did, how did you do that? Because that's it's so I, I actually wrote the book chronologically um, and using Ooh. that family tree, I would just stop at the beginning of every chapter and do a bit of research using um, a different book or, you know, oh. other kind of articles or whatever it was. Um, and then I would just kind of do enough research to make me feel as though I had entered the world of the character. Yeah. And then I would close the book, write the chapter, um, and keep going. And then after I finished the first draft, I read it over. Uh, if I had any kind of historical notes, I made note of that and then went back and did uh, added research onto that. But I yeah. wanted... Um, I wanted the research to feel really backgrounded and kind of atmospheric, and so I felt like it was important to write it chronologically so that I could have each character wow. reacting to choices that their parents had made, um, reacting to kind of the new places that they had moved. Um, so it felt important to me to, to write it chronologically. So you talked about doing research for each section. There's a question here from Intepa, and a couple of people are wondering the same thing. She says, how long did it take to do that research? And then to write a novel. For those of us who are wondering how we can get our six-figure deal for a novel, <laughs> tell us how much work actually goes into that. I mean, because I was writing um, incrementally or chronologically, I, um, I don't know if I could quantify how much research I did or how long the research took, um, but the novel itself took seven years oh. um, from, from 2009 to, um, to when it came out, seven years. So Travis, what do you make of your story where we, we did a show uh, about a year ago, which was about um, minorities and the publishing industry and how the publishing industry in the US and actually in parts of, the, of Europe is very skewed towards specific kind of authors and specific kind of stories. And then Yard turns that entire script on its head. And not only is she writing a story that crosses two continents, this amazing family tree, it is from the perspective of Africans, African Americans. And she's earned a ton of money. What do you make? And, and it's her first novel. What yeah. do you make of that? I mean, is that bizarre or to be celebrated or, or a milestone in publishing? What, what is going on here? I think, um, I mean, the lack of imagination in the publishing industry is like a lot of other industries, I think, um, yeah. even higher education at times. Um, but no, we have great. I mean, this is, this is a, it's a, a fantastic novel. And it, I mean, we do have wonderful. I think six or seven figure deal sort of um, novels. I guess the first one that, that comes to mind is though it took 10 years, I know for Juno to write his, is Juno Diaz's um, Brief Wonders Life of Oscar Wows, which would does span a similar kind of history and uh, era, but written very, very differently. Um, yeah, no, I mean, I, I think that that is a huge problem in the publishing industry, but um, yeah, we do get, I think, I think beautiful and um, more wide ranging and um, and, and, and lovely novels right. um, such as such as yours here. All right, uh, I, I book hub. It, it's been a pleasure. Uh, I know we have mm -hmm. more questions. Um, you're not. On, are you online? No, you're not. Yeah, you're not. You're not on Twitter. Are you? No, I'm not. <laughs> I don't on Twitter. <laughs> so this conversation ends here. <laughs> <laughs> One more question. One no more, more questions. questions. Eric Garagosia, Travis Sorry. and Yah, we're falling off the edge of the internet. <laughs> Thank you, Stream Book Club. It's been a pleasure. Yah, continued success. Arcosia, Erica and Travis, continued success. Thank you, online community. Uh, we're done. Take care, everybody. <laughs>